and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. We are going to do a musical analysis journey today, and this is kind of an ambitious project, but I was really feeling it. So we're going to take a look at Chopin's Opus 28 Preludes. Now, he wrote 24 preludes in this set, and we're not going to listen to 24 preludes today, but we are going to listen to 12 of them. We are going to look at the preludes number 1 through 12 today, and then in the next analysis video, I want to do the second half. This has been a heavily requested video, and the reason I wanted to do the whole set as a Opposed, well, there's a couple of reasons that I want to do the whole set and not just like one or two really famous preludes. Part of it is because the biggest part of it, I think, is that the preludes make the most sense to me as a whole, as like a unit. And when you isolate individual pieces from the set of preludes, they don't make as much sense. They don't have as much context. Like it's one thing to learn a Chopin waltz. You don't need to know all the other waltzes to know one waltz. But for me, the preludes, you it's really useful to have a sense of the big picture. So what we're going to do today is we're going to listen to a, a clip of every single one of the 12 preludes, except for number eight, but we'll get to that when we're talking about number eight. And we'll just talk about a few like key takeaways about the overall mood of the piece, any like musicality things that are worth discussing, basically anything that I think is interesting and worth talking about for it. So let's get started. <laughs> First, we have to discuss the preludes as a whole. So there are 24 of them. There's one prelude for every major and minor key on the piano. This style of writing, a prelude in every key, is actually a callback to Johann Sebastian Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier with a prelude and fugue in every single key. And it's a collection that Chopin was known to have loved. Aside from obvious style differences between Bach and Chopin, there's a big difference in the way that they are ordered. So their own collection of 24 preludes would would be ordered a little bit differently. So Bach's go in chromatic order. So the first prelude's in C major, second one's in C minor, then D major, and D minor, and E major. And it kind of keeps moving up and like that. Whereas Chopin's ordering is sort of a, I guess it's a little bit more complicated. It goes from the major key to the relative minor key, because C, and, C major and A minor are related. And then it jumps up the circle of fifths. So it goes from C major, does the minor, jumps up a fifth to G major, then does the minor. Then it would jump up the fifth to a D major, and then the minor, which would be B minor, and so on like that. These preludes were first published in 1839, and they're super diverse. Preludes as a whole are generally just opening numbers. They're like an introduction. But what Chopin does here is he takes the prelude and makes them self-contained units. So instead of being like the introduction for anything, they just kind of stand on their own. And they're all very short, which which is typical of all preludes, really. The longest one is number 17, which is 90 measures, which still isn't like crazy. And then the shortest one we'll talk about today, it's number nine, and it's only 12 measures. So they're d not only diverse in size, but they're also stylistically and emotionally diverse. In the preludes, Chopin basically covers the full spectrum of emotions and moods. These preludes are also very polarizing. Like, you either love them or you hate them. So an example of someone who loved them was Liszt, and he had this to say about the Opus 28 preludes. He says, Chopin's preludes are compositions of an order entirely apart. They are poetic preludes analogous to those of a great contemporary poet who cradles the soul in golden dreams. A very beautiful list. Whereas another famous composer who was highly critical of these preludes was Robert Schumann, who had this to say, they are sketches, beginnings of etudes, or so to speak, ruins, individual eagle pinions, all disorder and wild confusions. So whether or not you love or hate the preludes, mastering the whole set of them includes like, it's just a huge, arduous, monstrous task. And it requires you to have a really intimate knowledge of Chopin's style. Even if some of these pieces are individually quite simple, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, as I was kind of already talking about. And before we get into them individually, I just want to make a couple quick notes. So first of all, Chopin actually wrote three other preludes that aren't in this Opus 28 set, but I'm not including them because they're not in the set. And a final note is that Chopin himself didn't give nicknames to these pieces. It's, it's other people who gave nicknames to them. So uh, people might talk about, say, like the raindrop prelude, but that's like not Chopin's doing. I would I don't remember what number the raindrop one is, but he preferred to keep his titles simple and unambiguous. He called them waltz in A minor. He called them prelude number two. And other musicians have kind of attributed their own moody titles to them to help us remember what they're 
expression is going to be like. So two of these people who we're going to look at their subtitles is going to be Alfred Cortot and Hans von Bulau today. They were both uh, huge fans of Chopin. They're excellent musicians and they have lots of insight to offer us in terms of what they chose for the titles. All right, so we're going to start with the first prelude in C major, which is marked at agitato, agitated, with a couple subtitles. So Cortot is feverish anticipation of loved ones and Bulau's is reunion. It's a level six, which is uh, late intermediate, early advanced. The first prelude really opens with a bang. It's a really quick bang, too. The playtime of this one is less than a minute long, and it's written in the style of an arabesque. Sorry, I just kind of <laughs> sound it out while I write it. And what arabesques are is they're really quick dances. They're, they're super lively, and they're really bold. So musically, this, this piece is quite challenging, more so for the brain than for the hands, because the, the hands and rhythms do a lot of overlapping and leaping. You can kind of see these wide jumps in the left hand especially and it's written in four parts kind of like um choral choral works like soprano alto tenor and bass so let's look for these parts because the soprano is up here it's the top melody and sorry it is the melody and it's the top part and you're gonna hear this little this little part ring out the loudest in a performance of this piece uh, because it is the melody you've got this little dotted rhythm then if we jump to the alto which is going to be the second highest part you can kind of see this chord pattern in here jumping around which overlaps with the tenor part and what's really cool about the tenor part is that it echoes the exact same note as the soprano part g a g a and then you have the same thing, G-A, G-A, et cetera, throughout the whole piece. And this this is just a really neat overlapping, uh, mirroring, layering effect, even though the rhythms don't align. And then finally, we have the bass part, which is pretty obvious to see. You have these low, stretching, quick notes. I really like the subtitles for this one. The, the rapid notes are pretty, but this whole piece feels very uneasy. It's kind of like the feeling of being excited, but nervous, like like you know the subtitle says a reunion and that's kind of how you know you might feel it at a reunion of old friends for example so let's take a listen we got the second prelude in A minor at a slow lento tempo with uh, the subtitle of Painful Meditation, The Distant Deserted Sea, Presentiment of Death. So you can tell already this is going to be a lovely one. And it's at an intermediate level. I would actually say it would be like even early advance. It's a pretty tough piece. So this is what we're looking at here. This is a, obviously you've probably got this impression already, but it's a very dark and very dissonant prelude and it's generally one of the least liked preludes in the whole collection it it's it's just got this like really nothing in it sounds pleasant you've got just a bunch of like really awkward sounding off notes you'll hear it in a moment it's it's also deceptively challenging because the left hand is doing constant awkward wide leaps that that must be kept smooth so one of the harmonic techniques that Chopin uses to make this feel really unstable and really uneasy is his avoidance of the tonic. So what I mean by that is this this uh, little prelude is an A minor, but we don't really get the satisfaction of landing on an A minor chord throughout this piece. Like we start on an E minor and then we have this kind of like Chris uh, slow chromatic descent that never really lands on a comfortable note. But you got to give Chopin the benefit of a doubt here because he he's clearly telling us a story and that it's a somber story but he's he's making the statement that not every piece like life has to have pretty moments got the third prelude in G major at a vivace lively tempo with the subtitles the singing of the stream and thou art so like a flower or just 
flower. You get a very like organic, probably pleasant sounding tune just based on the subtitles. The level is again, a late intermediate level, pretty challenging. So what makes this one challenging are these very fast running 16th note patterns in the left hand. I, I like this one because it's the it's the complete tonal opposite of the second prelude. Like that one that you just heard is all doom and gloom and despair and like really ugly notes. Sorry, Chopin. And this one is very sunny and warm and open like flowers or streams. I find it interesting that the character of these preludes are so different, but there are some really major structural similarities. So for example, one thing they both have in common is they have a really busy left hand and a really sparse right hand, but completely different effects. <laughs> Prelude number four is in E minor. It's a largo, slow tempo, and the subtitles are, again, very grim, just like number two, Above a Grave and Suffocation. This is actually one of the easier Chopin pieces at a level four, as per Henley, or if you're doing the Royal Conservatory exam system, you could play that at a grade seven level. This is by far one of the most well-known preludes, and it's also one of the simplest to play. Not, I don't want to give you the wrong impression, like it's not simple, so if you're a beginner, this isn't the piece for you, but it is one of Chopin's simpler ones. So this fourth prelude calls back to the second one, the really dark, dismal one. They're, they're both slow, they're both involving weighty, blocked chord patterns, but where number two is like completely devoid of goodness, this one here, number four, it is more sad, but very musically beautiful. So it's nicer on the ears. So musically, just looking at it quickly, there's this really cool descending sound. You can kind of notice the chords here are slowly traveling downward in a chromatic pattern, which really gives you this feeling of like stepping into a grave. Notice that uh, you'll just notice the bass line is just constantly moving lower and lower and lower. So prelude number five, we go back to a major key in D. It's molto allegro, very fast. The subtitles are tree full of songs, which I, I find a very unusual subtitle, and then uncertainty, the much simpler subtitle. This is one of the most difficult ones we've looked at so far at a Henley level seven. It should be like RCM 10 or so probably. To me, this, this prelude calls back to the first one because it has this like delicate interlacing of a whole bunch of different notes in both hands. So what you have here is the challenge of getting the sort of unusual melody kind of buried in the middle here. You can see this chromatic pattern uh, with the accented notes. So the challenge is getting this to sing out while keeping the inner harmonies soft. And then you've got to accomplish the huge left hand stretches lightly. And because of this, it's like I mentioned, one of the more difficult preludes in the set. As for the mood and the character, I think it's best described as ambiguous. Like, is it happy? Is it sad? Is it light? Is it dark? It kind of ends up blending all of these different shades together. So it simultaneously captures none of them and all of them. So it feels, again, ambiguous. I want you to pay attention to this, especially to this like sneaky semitone motive that is weaved in throughout the piece. The sixth prelude is in B minor and the tempo is pretty slow, lento asai, and the subtitles are homesickness and tolling bells, which is going to be kind of like a funeral reference. The grade level here is a little bit easier, three to four in Henley standards and by RCM standards, that would be grade eight. So this is another one of the simpler and definitely another one of the more famous preludes. Chopin actually requested that this one be played during his funeral, hence the, the bells reference. Chopin's lover, George Sand, wrote that this prelude precipitates the soul into frightful depression, which is a sentiment that I think sums up the sound of this song quite nicely, this piece. So you've got this repeated right hand eighth note motif 
that goes through the entire piece. It's a very steady pattern. It's, it reminds me almost of like the pattering of rain. And then you have the middle notes, which as per usual are filling in the harmonies. And finally, the left hand is this beautiful, warm left hand melody. It gives us that like nice, rich feeling of a cello. So for prelude number seven, we jump to A major with the tempo on Dantino. And this one is dubbed the sensational memories float like perfume through my mind. Very, very fabulous. And then Bulao's subtitle is the Polish dancer because this is going to be a mazurka. The level is another fairly like relatively easy one. Henley level three to four, which you would more or less translate to RCM seven or eight. So this is an incredibly short prelude. It's only 16 bars and it's probably the calmest of all of the preludes in the collection. So even though the notes themselves are pretty simple to play, like say for example, prelude four or prelude six, it does require refined playing to capture its beauty. This is actually one of the main reasons I never teach Chopin to children because there's just, there's too much emotional complexity and subtle shading that's required that kids just don't necessarily have yet because they have like such small amounts of life experience. So anyway, back to this one. I like that this prelude never hits like a super big forte or like a huge climactic moment. So even though we have this crescendo and this is our focal point of the pieces is our, our climax with this giant F sharp chord in bar 12, we never want to get to like a huge loud forte in this part. And I, I really just think it's like, a, listen to the whole thing in, in its entirety because we're not going to listen to the whole thing in this clip. But I really think that just like the subtle build is all it needs. As previously mentioned, this is written in the style of a mazurka, which is a, a Polish dance. Chopin wrote a lot of them. And you can see this rhythmic pattern in the right hand repeating itself. And that's kind of indicative of the style. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. You see that kind of like dotted rhythm here and here and here and throughout the entire piece. Prelude number eight is in F sharp minor. It's molto agitato, very agitated, and it has probably my favorite subtitle so far. The snow falls, the wind screams, and the storm rages. Yet in my sad heart, the tempest is the worst to behold. Wow, that's some, uh, some good sad poetry right there. And then Bulao's simpler subtitle is Desperation. This is a very, very difficult prelude. So one of the reasons that it's so difficult is because you have this this dotted rhythmic melody in the middle. So, and then like you have this, this melody, you can kind of see because the stems are going down in the treble clef, that melody is going through while you have all these like teeny tiny little grace notes basically decorating the entire thing. These like crazy fast notes. The whole thing is obviously very fast because Molto Agitato tells us that. And then we have all these 16th notes and grace notes, which or fast also, but not only that, you also have to deal with polyrhythm. And this is another big challenge of the piece because you'll notice the rhythm of the left hand and the rhythm of the right hand do not like neatly line up. So that's a, that makes it a really big challenge in order to play this smoothly. So the overall character of this piece, which you could guess from the subtitles is very tormented and impassioned. And I have bad news for you because this is one of the few preludes in the set that I actually don't have a recording of just because of copyright reasons, but but what I will do is I'm going to link here on the screen a recording to Margaret Argerich's YouTube performance of the prelude. It's, it's amazing. So like, seriously, click that link, go check that out. I'll wait here. Prelude number nine is in E major. It is slow largo and the subtitles are prophetic voices and vision. Very, very almost like religious here from the subtitles and it's an intermediate level. The mood of this piece is very grand and it almost, as I kind of mentioned already, it almost feels like a spiritual like prophecy or something like that. It's not super technically difficult. There's like all this, there's all this right hand cording and triplets, but it's balanced by a simpler left hand part that does like align neatly. And 
there are these really cool, where are they? Really cool, like, left-hand trills here, and there's another one there. They're very, very deep and low, and they add an unexpected ambience. They're actually one of my favorite parts of the piece, so listen for that. This moves at a march-like pace. It's not too fast. Um, anything faster than, like, a slow and broad tempo would shatter the grandeur, so it needs that slower tempo. So musically, if we look at that, you can see the stems are going up here, so this is our melody up in the higher registers. And this is going to be the part that you're going to be hearing the most clearly. So typical to some of these other preludes, it's surrounded by triplet chording in the middle and then a strong melodic bass line. Number 10 is in C sharp minor. It's very fast. And the subtitles are, are kind of, they get the same idea, but in completely different ways. So one of them is rockets that fall back down to earth. And the other one is the night moth who then later dies. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. And the difficulty is quite challenging. I know I'm a broken record when I say this, but this is a unique prelude in the group. I know, I know, I know. They're all, for the most part, unique. Uh, and I hope you're noticing that too. I hope you're starting to see like just how diverse the range of characters are in these tiny little preludes. So anyway, what sets number 10 apart is it, it has a very like hesitating and abrupt feel. And I don't have it on the screen here, but there are a few fermatas that add to that. This is a short piece. This is a fast piece. And it's an, an intense arabesque, uh, kind of just like the first prelude had an arabesque feel to it too. So this is kind of morbid, but I really like Bulao's interpretation of this one, like the, the night moth one. So I want to I wanna quote him. And he describes the piece like this. A night moth is flying around the room there. It suddenly hides itself and its wings twitch a little. In a moment, it, it he's talking specifically about like the path of this, this song. So when you're listening to it, listen for this. Anyway, in a moment, it takes flight anew and again settles down in darkness. Its wings flutter. And there's like a trill in the left hand that corresponds with this fluttering. So this happens several times, but at last, just as the wings begin to quiver again, the busybody who lives in the room aims a stroke at the poor insect. It switches once and dies. Whoa. <laughs> Number 11 moves to B major. It's vivace, very fast, lively, and it's the story of a desire of a young girl, or very differently, the dragonfly. The difficulty is fairly high, Henley 6 or 7, which is like, I would even say like early advanced. So what makes this one more advanced is that it's got some like pretty crazy hand stretches. It's got a like obviously a fast tempo. And the thing that I think is challenging about this one is that it has dynamics that you see these like crescendos and diminuendos and stuff. They need to be noticeable, but they can never be like too much. And it's really easy to accidentally like go overboard with dynamics. So anyway, I love this prelude's charming and light character. I, I really like Bulao's description again. Um, I like the dragonfly title because that's kind of just what it feels like when I listen to it. There's there's this constant steady flow of notes, which gives it a very open and freeing feel. Like, you know, like a winged creature flying along quickly and relentlessly. That's what I think anyway. this video we have prelude number 12 in g sharp minor at a very very fast presto tempo and it's been nicknamed night ride and the duel it's one of the most challenging ones in the set so number 12 is officially the halfway point of the preludes and as i mentioned it's the last one we're going to do in this video until next month and what makes it super super difficult aside from its crazy fast tempo is the constant double notes that you see kind of like over and over you have 
these repeated two notes. And not only that, but you have these like tiny little slurs, these two note slurs, which gives it a very like almost a sound of a struggle to have to kind of lift every couple beats. Da, 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 da. It makes it feel very intense. I, I can't think of a better word than that. And that is very challenging to play as well as having these huge left hand octave jumps constantly. So by one interpretation, this is a fight song like Bulao saying it's the sound of a duel. And you can kind of see it's almost like the hands are struggling with each other, they're struggling to play. And it, it gives, you'll notice when you're listening to it, it just has the sound of a struggle. But I also like Corto's subtitle, The Night Ride, because then you're looking at the stunted phrases, almost like the like horse hooves hitting the ground. And I think both are kind of cool ways to think about it. Um, the right hand is doing these tiny little baby ascending chromatic steps and the left hand is doing the exact opposite like these great big leaps and I think it creates a really cool contrast and adds to the overall tense feel. <laughs> this musical analysis journey until next month when we complete it with the second half of this. I hope you enjoyed it. I was, I had a blast doing this project. I love the preludes. I think they're really cool. I'm definitely on the side of the fence that is a fan of them, not the side of the, you know, the Schumann side of the fence that's kind of like anti-preludes. But I'd love to know what you guys think. Feel free to leave comments. I always like reading what you guys have to say about this. And if you have any suggestions, opinions, ideas, I'd love to hear them. If you want to visit me on social, I exist on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, which you can find linked. I also exist on Patreon. So if you want to like help this channel be the best it can be, definitely hop over there and see the different rewards and stuff like that we got. So thanks for everyone who watches these videos and who helps make these videos possible and helps them continually improve and get better and hopefully be useful. I'll catch you in the next video. Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV, where I itch my eyebrow. <laughs> Very fascinating channel. <laughs>